Welcome, we are in Senior English A, and our objective today now is to work with the four sonnets of Shakespeare that you have provided for you in your hymnal. Now, right away, I want to start on 272. You should look there just for a second uh, for your annotations, because you know some of this information is coming on the exam. Notice under literary analysis that we're going to be talking about the Shakespearean sonnet. If I have assigned a, uh, a sonnet to you to write, it is the Shakespearean sonnet. That is to say... 14 lines of iambic pentameter with a certain kind of rhyme scheme that is A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F, G, G. Now that A, B, A, B is four lines, and so we call that a, see on the right-hand side of, the, of 272, we call that a quatrain. Quatrain, that is to say qua four, right? So you got four lines that go together that are going to represent a theme or an idea. Do you see it? One of the easy ways at level one to work with these four poems is to do this little diagram where you've got, notice, three quatrains, three times four is right, and then you've got a final two-line couplet to get you your 14 lines. Do you got me? Now what we want to do is we want to look at Shakespeare's four, and uh, I'm not going to do them in the order that they are in the book, okay? I'm going to do them in the order of importance for us, so I'm going to start actually on 276, all right? So I'm going to start with Sonnet 116 first. And I want to make sure that we have spent some time here, because this, of the four sonnets that are introduced to us here by Shakespeare, this is certainly considered the most important when you take a look at the, uh, at, at the writings of academics who study the, all, of, all of Shakespeare's sonnets. Sonnet 116, Let me not to the marriage of true minds and men impediments. So this is the first one we're going to work with. I'm going to follow the same protocol for all four of these poems. We're going to read it, and then we're going to exegete it, we're going to try to look at it as its quatrains unfold, those four lines. Do you got me? Studying each one of these poems will help you. Now, we have asked that you commit to memory Sonnet 116. The easiest way, and this kind of answers this earlier question about I can't come up with any more ways to write poems in iambic pentameter. The easiest way to do it is just to memorize, if not the entire poem, a few lines of the poem and get the rhythm inside your head. So you can hear that, ba-bum, 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 and all of that. Let's take a look at it. Sonnet 116. The first thing I want you to write down on your annotations about Sonnet 116 is that this is the great poem about eternal love. Does it exist? Does it not exist? What would real love, as opposed to lust, look like? And Shakespeare's going to write a poem where he's going to say two things. Real love really does exist, and this is kind of what it looks like, how you know it exists. Let's take a look at it. Let me not, you should be reading with me now on 276, let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediments. Love is not love, which alters when an alteration finds, or bends with the remover to remove. Oh no, it's an ever-fixed mark that looks on tempests and is never shaken. It is the star to every wondering, whose worth's unknown, although his height be taken. Love's not time's fool, no rosy lips and cheeks within his bending sickle's compass come. Love alters not, with his brief hours and weeks, bears it out, even to the edge of doom. If this be Aaron upon me proved, I never writ, nor no man ever loved. Now, let's work through this poem. We'll identify four line, four line segments, which what do we call those? Quatrains. Quatrains. And so we'll just take a look at this poem. Notice how he begins. He says, I don't want to get in the way of the marriage or the meeting together, the coming together of true minds. In other words, for your notes, I don't want to say there is no such thing as true love. That is to say, there is such a thing as true love. Really? Well, what is love? He doesn't start there. He tells you what it's not. Love is not love. Are you reading it with me? Which alters when it alteration finds, or bends with the remover to remove. Do you know guys like this? Oh, I'm so in love with this girl. Two days later, I hate her guts. His pals are like, dude, just two days ago you said you were in love. No, no, not anymore. Shakespeare says, nah, that's not love. Love does not alter even though it finds alteration. It does not bend with the remover to remove. In other words, the other person can stop loving you, but if you're truly in love, you don't stop. That's his view of love. Then he uses an interesting word picture. Now, in Shakespeare's day, let's call it 1600 for your notes. In Shakespeare's day, how, if you're on a ship, do you navigate through the bad weather? See, because you, you don't have 
often even yet a compass. You certainly don't have GPS. Sorry. That's the only way. But wait a minute. Rocklutner says stars plural. But of course he understands something. Those stars all move and make it hard to navigate by. There's only going to be one star that you actually can navigate by. That is the, that's the North Star. You got it. So write this in your notes. Shakespeare is going to argue that the North Star is the way that you make your... He uses the word bark. There's three kinds of barks. There's the bark of Ruthie's tree. There's the bark that I attempted to do in my recitation of the poem. And then, of course, there's this bark called a ship, right? He says, when the ship is wandering, oh, no, it's an ever-fixed mark. Why does he use fixed? That gets him his iambic pentameter. It is an ever fixed mark. See how that works? That's iambic pentameter. Ba -bum, ba -bum, ba -bum, ba -bum, right? So the fixed ed gets him his extra syllable so that he gets his iambic pentameter. It's an ever fixed mark that looks on tempest. What's a tempest? It's a storm, right? That looks on tempest and is never shaken. It is the star to every wandering lost bark ship whose worth's unknown. You don't know the value of the North Star until his height be taken. When you use the North Star, to make your measurements so that you can navigate, that's when you know the value of the North Star. What's that got to do with love? Write it down. What's his point about love? True love. Whoa, this is interesting. I've had seniors that go, this is a fascinating idea. You won't know if you are in true love until you hit the tempest, the bad stuff. It isn't that everything is great. That's not how you're going to know your love. Oh, it's so wonderful. We're always happy. It's so great. No. Shakespeare says that's not the way to know whether you're in true love. True love you'll know when you're in the middle of the storm, the bad stuff. Are you able to get through it because of that love? In the same way that a ship gets through because it looks at the North Star. If that's the case, in other words, the most important times for a guy and a girl and a couple is when things are going bad, not when they're great. Not when they're great. I mean, I, I heard students say, well, things were going great. That was love. Things went sideways. That's when things went bad. Then we broke up. Shakespeare says, what about that? Yeah, that, then it wasn't love. Because it's in love that you find out really what the value of the storm is all about. Because why? You get through it. What's the only way you get through it? Love. Notice he continues, loves not time's fool. Now, wait a minute. You see time is capitalized. Do you remember that segment from Dickens' Christmas Carol? He's visited by three ghosts. Remember the ghost of Christmas past, the ghost of Christmas present? What was the third ghost? Do you remember? The ghost of Christmas future. Do you remember what he's dressed like? Do you remember? He's dressed like death. How do you know death when it's dressed? A couple of things. Has a black hood on. And then it has that thingy in its hand, right? It has a sight in that thing. What's that all about? Well, human life is imagined to be like a grain of wheat that grows. And death comes along as father time and cuts it, i.e. death. Take a look at what he says about young and old and love. Love's not time's fool, though rosy lips and cheeks Within his bending sickles, that side thing, compass come. What does he mean? Put it in your own words. Love's not time's fool. Though rosy lips and cheeks. Who, who has rosy lips and cheeks? Uh, young or old? Yeah. Young. Though rosy lips and cheeks, within his bending sickles, compass come. In other words, inevitably people get old. And what do we know about everything in that first box? It all sags and bags, right? Right? Remember? In other words, what's he say about true love? Even though that person gets old and by extension starts to get kind of ugly, right? Is not as beautiful. Doesn't have the rosy lips and cheeks anymore. Still what? Love is still going to be there. Take a look at how he says it. Oh no, love's not time's fool. Though rosy lips and cheeks within his bending sickles compass come. Love alters not with its brief hours and weeks. Love does not change over time, but bears it out even to the edge of doom. Whoa, what's that say about true love? What is this thing about the edge of doom? True love goes all the way to death. As they say in the ceremonies, till death do us part, right? Now, Shakespeare's aware 
there may be one or two people, especially the girl he's writing this poem for, uh, that might roll their eyes and say, yeah, right, that doesn't exist, true love. Look at how he finishes his couplet. If this argument about true love be error, see, you're reading it with me. If this be error, or I'm wrong, and upon me proved, I never read, nor no man ever loved. What's the irony? He says, if I'm wrong about this, then I never wrote a poem. And no guy ever loved a girl. But how do we know he wrote a poem? We're reading. Therefore, by extension, if I can write a poem about it, I'm telling you I know about it, which is to say code language for, right, you're my girl, I love you. See how that works? In other words, this is a really subtle way for him to say to his girl two things. One, I know that true love exists because I wrote it in a poem. I wrote about it in a poem. Two, I don't just write about it in a poem, but I actually will practice it myself. See how that works? Now, uh, that's, that's kind of a, a, the penultimate statement of true love. Uh, 3B question real quickly for your notes, and then we'll move on. Question, do you think that people today still believe in the idea of true love, eternal love? That is to say, a love that does not alter with times, brief hours, and weeks. Do you think that's still true? Or is that kind of an old-fashioned idea of love? And love now today is more about kind of closer to, you know, a pragmatic view. You love until you don't. You're with the person until you're not. Things change. Stuff happens. It's just the way that it is. Question two at 3B. See, and you can write these down and you can think about them later. Do you think guys and girls today have different views of this idea of love? Does a guy have a certain view of what is called love and a girl have a different view of what is called love? Or rather, are they the same? So, for example, the girl came back from this lecture the next day and said, well, it happened last night. And the class went, what happened last night? She said, yeah, my guy, we've been dealing together a long time. He looked at me and said, I love you. And for whatever reason, I think it was because of Sonnet 116, I just looked at him and said, what does that mean? And he went, what do you mean, what does it mean? She said, you know, you just said, I love you. What does it mean? He said, you know what it means. And she said, I know what it means when I use the term. I want you to tell me what it means when you use the term. What does it mean to you? He gets mad. He's like, that's a dumb question. She's like, why is that a dumb question? You're the one using the word to me. I want to know what you think it means. He goes, everyone knows what it means. Why do I got to use it in words? Everyone knows. She's like, can you explain to me what it means when you use the term, I love you? Like, what does that mean? Is it kind of like, you know, Sonnet 116? And he went, what? Sonnet? What is that even about? See, and she was like, okay, forget it. You know, but here's the question. Our guys and girls, do they see it the same way? Final, third question. This is an interesting question. Do you believe in your life that you are destined to love one and only one person for your whole life? And you meet that one person, or you don't meet that one person, but that's it. Or are you rather inclined to say you can meet a person, fall in love, you can either break up or death happens or whatever, and then you can meet another person and fall in love. In other words, you can love multiple people in your lifetime. Are you of that persuasion? Or are you more inclined to say love is basically a one-shot gig? You get the one chance at it, and that's it. Just asking, just asking. By the way, who these sonnets, uh, the mystery of the sonnets, by the way, on 277, that's a fascinating little bit of reading yourself. You can do on your own. Let's go down to the next one, Sonnet 130, all right? Mm -hmm. Shakespeare likes to make fun. So you want to write this one down in Sonnet 130, okay? Shakespeare likes to make fun. He especially, are you ready for this? He likes to make fun of bad country songs. Sorry, but you know what I mean when I say bad country songs? I love her deeper than the ocean, taller than the mountain, higher than the trees, and all that other kind of stuff, right? All that other kind of, oh, oh, right, 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 all that kind of stuff. That's what I mean, that's what I mean, okay? Now, here's the deal. Shakespeare is going to make fun of the bad country music songs of his day. I said country music. I could have used any genre. I was just making a joke, right? Just making a joke, just making a joke. In other words, you got all these guys writing poems that are kind of trying to emulate the Italian sonneteer Petrarch, where basically they say, my girl is the most beautiful, stunning woman imaginable. Shakespeare decides to write a different poem. His poem is to say, you know what? Let's just read it. My mystery's eyes, my girl's eyes, are nothing like the sun. 
Whoa! So right away, let's go ahead and take a look at it. He's going to say about his girl, yeah, she ain't no drop-dead Victoria's Secret model. Let's take a look. Now, some people have said that this poem is Shakespeare actually saying mean things about his girl. You decide. I'll read it with you. Take a look. Read it with me. My mistress' eyes are nothing like the sun. Coral is far more red than her lips red. If snow be white, why then her breasts are done. If hairs be wires, black hairs grow on her head. I've seen roses to mask red and white, but no such roses see I in her cheeks. And in some perfumes there is more delight than in the breath that from my mistress reeks. I love to hear her speak, yet well I know that music hath a far more pleasing sound. I grant I never saw a goddess go. My mistress, when she walks, treads on the ground. And yet, by heaven, I think my love is rare as any she belied with false compare. Now, there are two ways to read this poem. One is that this is the greatest Jack poem of all time, where he basically says about his girl, yeah, not so much. The other argument is a more fascinating one, and it runs something like this. What if a guy fell in love with a girl who wasn't the Victoria's Secret mom? And she knew it, and guess what? He knew it too, and he did not care because she was his girl. And he didn't want to lie and say she's stunningly beautiful. And so he decides to tell the truth about his girl. And about her he says the following. First of all, her eyes. Yeah, they're not like the sun. Like some bad country lyrics, you know, no, no. Look at the next one. Coral is far more red than her lips are red. Yeah, she doesn't have the most beautiful red lips. Look at the next one. If snow be white, why then her breasts are done. Now, interestingly, find out something about this. During Elizabethan England, women were considered more beautiful the whiter and paler they were. So the more they looked like death and pale white, the more beautiful they were considered, and the darker that they were, the less beautiful they were considered. Notice here, the word done here is actually a word dumb. That is to say, she isn't pale white, she's brown. She's brownish color. And in Shakespeare's day, Brown was not considered beautiful. Today, of course, the complete opposite, right? I mean, women try to get nice and tanned when the, finally the sun comes out and everything, right? Interesting. If hairs be wires, black hairs grow on her head. She doesn't have pretty hair, right? I've seen roses to mask red and white, but no such roses see on her cheeks. She doesn't have beautiful cheeks. And in some perfumes, there is more delight than in the breath that from my mistress rakes. She's got bad breath. She maybe could use a tic tac. <laughs> I love to hear her speak, yet well I know that music hath a far more pleasing sound. She doesn't have, have the most amazing voice. She doesn't have the most uh, pleasing, pleasing voice. I grant, I never saw a goddess go, that is to say walking. I never saw a, go I never, I never saw a go goddess walk. My mistress, when she walks, treads on the ground. In other words, she's not a really graceful walker. By the way, Lord Byron, do you remember this one, right? Um, that, that poem that Lord Byron wrote? about his beautiful woman that he thought about. Remember, we even talked about that poem in regards to um, she, she walks like the night, remember? That beautiful, that beautiful ebony. Uh, he knew this poem, obviously. I mean, he was writing 1800, 200 years after this poem. And yet, Shakespeare says, about his girl, by heaven, I think my love as rare as any she belied with false compare. Wow, what's he saying? Yeah, isn't that fascinating? Even though she's not a Victoria's Secret model, even though she's not stunningly physically beautiful, even though she is, can we use this word, a normal girl. He says, I love her way more than any other girl I could imagine. A 3B question, and then we'll move on. Do you think it's true that most guys are much happier with a quote-unquote normal girl than with a supermodel girl. That is to say, a girl that's just perfect for them. Doesn't have to be perfect for everybody else. Right? Can guys can guys do that, do you think? Or are guys of the kind, just like in our Wife of Bath's tale, remember, when he gets his option, what was option A? To have me normal, but a good girl. Or option B, a Victoria's Secret model, right? It's interesting to ask, do you think that view about girls changes 
as guys get older and they begin to mature and then they begin to realize that beauty is only one small part of happiness with a girl. Hmm. Interesting. All right, let's keep going. We've got two more sonnets to get through, and uh, the, next, the, the uh, two that we're going to finish with are on page 275, sonnet 29, sonnet 106. Now, this is a fun poem, because the guy, are you ready for this? I'm ready, I'm ready now, it's sonnet 29. This is a fun poem, because, like all the other ones too, but for sure this one. This is the poem written by the cat who wrote Romeo and Juliet. Uh, for those of you who are struggling to write 14 lines of iambic, again, I'll remind you, he wrote the entire play of Romeo and Juliet in iambic pentameter. Amazing. It's an amazing accomplishment. But he also wrote, of course, a whole lot of other stuff. I mean, we're going to leave here in a few minutes, a uh, few days. We're going to leave our study of this poetry, and we're going to go to the plays of Shakespeare, and we're going to look at Macbeth, and we're going to look at Hamlet, and we're going to say, yeah, these are some amazing texts that he created. That guy who wrote that stuff says... I have lots of self-doubt about my ability as a writer. Interesting. Shakespeare, the greatest writer ever lived, had bummer days where he thought he was a loser. Take a look at this poem. Yeah, take a look at this poem. When, are you reading with me? Are you reading with me? Again, 275, Sonic 29. When in disgrace with fortune and men's eyes, I all alone beweep my outcast state. And trouble deaf heaven with my bootless cries, and look upon myself and curse my fate. Wishing me like to one more rich in hope, featured like him, like him with friends possessed, desiring this man's art and that man's scope, with what I most enjoy content at least. Yet in these thoughts myself, almost despairing, happily I think on thee. And then my state, like to the lark at break of day arising from sullen earth, Sings hymns at heaven's gate. For thy sweet love remembered such wealth brings, that then I scorn to change my state with kings. Aww. See, you're supposed to go, aww, at the end of a poem like this. This is a quintessential poem about love, but it's interesting how he gets there. Let's exegete quickly. The first quatrain says, When in disgrace with fortune and men's eyes, I all alone beweep my outcast state. Put it in your own words. When I do what? When I feel sad because I'm alone. Right? Alone. I trouble deaf heaven with my bootless cries, look upon myself, and curse my fate. The guy that wrote Romeo and Juliet, that wrote the greatest play of all time, Hamlet, says, sometimes I feel like I'm a complete loser, an outcast. I, in other words, I've done nothing. Take a look at how he continues. Wishing me like to one more rich in hope. I wish I had more reason to hope, like other people. Featured like him, like him with friends possessed. I wish I had friends like other people have. I'm all alone. Desiring this man's art and that man's scope. I wish I had talent. Shakespeare wrote, I wish I had talent. Like other people, like other contemporaries of his. I wish I had talent. Yet, line nine, there's a shift. Yet in these thoughts myself almost despising. Happily, I think on thee. Put it in your own words. When I get really sad and I feel like I'm ready to jump off the cliff, what do I do? I think on thee. Right, I think on my girl. And then my state, like to the lark, a lark is a bird that sings in the morning, at break of day arising from sullen earth, sings hymns at heaven's gate. In other words, when I get really sad, all I have to do is think about my girl, and I become like the songbird in the morning. And then finally he says, when I remember my sweet love, when thy sweet love remembered such wealth brings, that I can scorn to change my state with kings. In other words, I would rather be with my girl and be happy than to have all those things that I sometimes wish, like fame and fortune, money and stuff, power. He says, I would much rather have my girl than have all of those things. So what do you think? This one, by the way, is going to work rather nicely in 3A, 3A with John Keats's poem, When I Have Fears That I May Cease to Be, Before My Pen Has Gleaned My Teeming Brain. Do you remember that one? When I feel like I'm about ready to die, and I remember what he says at the very last rhyme couplet, Then on the shore of the white world I stand alone and think, till love and fame to nothingness do sink. Do you think Keats maybe knew the sonnets of Shakespeare, especially Sonnet 29? Oh yeah, absolutely. He's playing an emulation game, remember? 
Shakespeare, 1600. John Keats, 1800, 200 years later. Remember, we studied John Keats, though, earlier, right, in Senior English B. Let's look now, finally, at Sonnet 106. <clears throat> this is an interesting poem because it says the following. You are beautiful, but you are even more beautiful than all of the beautiful people who came before you. All of the beautiful people who came before you were just getting the world ready for your beauty. Now that's interesting. Let's take a look at how... Let's look at how he says, this is the great compliment poem. One or two female readers of this poem have said, if a guy wants to tell me that I'm beautiful, I'm not going to disagree. I'm not going to tell him that he can't do it. That's always the question, though, what's the right way to tell a girl that she's hot? Do you, you don't want to come off as being what we say disingenuous, that is to say untrue, right? Take a look at how Shakespeare says it. When in the chronicle of wasted time... I see descriptions of the fairest waits, and beauty making beautiful old rhyme and praise of ladies dead and lovely nights. Then in the blazon of sweet beauty's best of hand, of foot, of lip, of eye, or brow, I see their antique pen would have expressed even such beauty as you master now. So all their praises are but prophecies of this our time, all you prefiguring. And... Uh, for they looked but with divining eyes, they had not skill enough your worth to sing. For we, which now behold these present days, have eyes to wonder, but lack tongues to praise. That is an interesting poem. And it raises a really interesting question that I'll ask you at 3D, and it's this. And it has something to do with this question that was raised earlier uh, about that drawing on 274. And it's this. Do you think beautiful people remain beautiful through history, or is rather beauty in not only the personal eye of the beholder, but beauty is also in the cultural eye of the beholder. Do you get my drift? In other words, so you go back a hundred years and you call up, you know, you can do this on Google pretty easily, who were the hottest looking people a hundred years ago? Most of the time it's going to be either in really old photographs or it's going to be in paintings, right? And you take a look at the most beautiful people. Are they still considered beautiful today? See, they were considered the drop-dead gorgeous Sports Illustrated swimsuit models, the, uh, you know, Calvin Klein underwear models, if you're talking about a guy or whatever, right? The David Beckhams of a long time ago, right? Okay. Those were considered beautiful people then. Today, they're often not considered beautiful, which begs a really intriguing question. Is it possible that at some point in the future, way, way in the future, that you could put a Sports Illustrated swimsuit model up in front of students, and they would go, ooh. <laughs> like, ooh, what is up with that? <laughs> well, some of you said that about 274. Ooh, dude, what is up? Right? And this is just one example. I could give lots of examples of this. It's like, whoa, that's considered beauty? What's up with that? You know, that kind of thing, right? It begs, obviously, the question, how do you determine who is beautiful? Let me give you a classic example of this. Look at 277. I want to show you who some people believe Shakespeare wrote these poems for. She's right there on 277. Amelia Bassano. Now look at hot Amelia. Right. She was the swimsuit model of her day. Some of you will say, yeah, not so much. Now this begs a really intriguing question. Do we find that through time... Our tastes regarding what is beautiful does change. And how does that happen? Let me ask you at a personal level. If you can remember back to this point when you were in middle school and what you consider to be the prettiest people in your class, the most beautiful, guys or girls, has that remained the same to your senior year? And how has that changed? Why has that changed? Okay. Uh, some of it had to do with personality. But let's stick with physical beauty because that's where Shakespeare is in this poem. He is going to celebrate physical beauty in Sonnet 106. He is going to say in Sonnet 106, so you can write this in your notes, he is going to say that women before you were not as beautiful as you. You 
were, you're like the completion of those women. Which begs a really interesting question. Well, by definition, then that means that there will come a point when the most beautiful people today will be considered ugly? And if you lock in your brain a person who you consider to be, either in the movies or music or whatever, to be considered a beautiful person, that no one would debate today is going to be considered beautiful anywhere on this planet, how do you explain the fact then that there may be a, a point when people look at her and go, or him, and go, ugh, what's wrong? Fascinating how that works. Does beauty change over time? Notice finally he will say the only, the only uh, uh, thing we can do is, is today is worship your beauty. Question, do girls want to be told that they are hot? Do they like that? Do they want to be told that they are more beautiful than other girls? Or do they want to be told, yeah, you're all right. They want to be told that they're hot. Now, what if they're, what if they're only kind of okay? Should the guy lie? No. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Should the guy lie and say, no, 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 you are the most... Do you think it's true girls want to be told they're beautiful? Why do girls need to be told they're beautiful? It's a compliment. But... Compared to what are they considered to be beautiful? So in other words, you're supposed to say you're better looking than all the other girls I know. No, you say you're better looking than Oh, so in other words, find some girl that's butt ugly. The sonnets of Shakespeare, let's make some final observations. What do you want to say about all four of these poems? All four of them have to do with what? That's it. Love and beauty, right? All four of them have to do with love and beauty, right? Notice in all four of the poems, save one, you have a tribute poem to love and beauty, right? Notice Sonnet 130 is going to de-emphasize that. But what are you going to say about Sonnet 116, though? Does he emphasize anything? What does he say about love and beauty? Right. Right, that's, that's, that's exactly right. Notice what he says in Sonnet 116 about love and beauty. Notice, beautiful lips and cheeks don't matter. Because why? What do we know about beautiful lips and cheeks? Sooner or later, they all come within the bending sickle's compass. That is to say, sooner or later, everything sags and bags. Right? And the question is, can you still love a person once they're no longer physically attractive? Now, we'll finish with this question. Do you think people today can fall in love without ever seeing each other? I had a student, and he said to me, upon graduating from high school in a few days, I'm leaving for Australia. And I went, for Australia? And he said, yes, I'm going to get married. And I went, you're going to get married? And he said, yeah, I'm going to get married. In Australia? Yeah, to an Australian girl. I said, how did you meet an Australian girl? And he said, oh, I met her on the internet. And I said, you met her on the internet, how? He said, oh, we've been gaming, and I met her. We've been talking back and forth. I said, amazing. Well, what does she look like? Oh, I don't know. I said, what do you mean you don't know? He said, oh, I've never actually seen a picture of her, and she's never seen a picture of me. We decided that we were compatible intellectually, and therefore decided we did not need to see each other before we finally met to get married. Because he said... Beauty is only skin deep. And so we, we knew we are in love, but we're in love with each other's minds. Now this begs a really intriguing question. Do you believe that kind of thing can actually exist? And if you answer no, I will ask you the simple question, which you probably already preempted. Well then what about people who don't have sight? What about people who are either born blind or lose their sight? Doesn't matter. Right. But do you think they can fall in love then? They can fall in love even though they don't have the ability to see. So you're saying you can fall in love without sight. And therefore you can fall in love without meeting the other person and seeing him or her physically. So you're saying my student actually could have been in love for reals. Even though he had never seen him. They had spoken, right? They had spoken on the phone. But most of their relationship was through email and texting. Right? Email and texting. Uh, at this point, this was a few years ago, there was no FaceTime yet. So there was no ability to do that. But he argued, 
If it had existed, he didn't want to do it anyway. You want to know the rest of the story? They didn't get married. <laughs> Sorry, I just finished the story. I don't know. Sorry, I didn't mean to blow up the you know, the mythology or anything. 